Welcome to K Passionate. I'm your host, KP, a marine biologist with over a decade's worth of experience working with marine mammals. We've spent a lot of time on this channel talking about the amazing adaptations of marine mammals, like a sea otter's incredible metabolism, or the amazing depths that seals can dive to. But today, we're gonna to talk about one of the most extreme migrations in the animal kingdom, the salmon run. But first, don't forget to like, subscribe, and head down to the descriptions below for ways that you can help support this channel. If you've come along for any of our previous deeper dives, you might have heard me talk about something called a keystone species, which is an organism that holds the ecosystem together, much like the keystone in an archway. Without keystone species, ecosystems can collapse. Sea otters are a great example because they keep sea urchin populations in check. Without sea otters, those urchin populations can boom, devastating kelp forests. We've talked in depth about that in the previous deeper dive and you can check that out right up here. Salmon species, especially Pacific salmon, are also a keystone species. And that's largely due to the fact that they actually migrate across multiple ecosystems. And a surprisingly large amount of animals and plants rely on them as a nutrient source. It's a complicated and often mind-blowing life cycle. So let's start at the beginning. Here, in one of these countless rivers in the Pacific Northwest, is a spawning ground for Pacific salmon. Every salmon species life cycle usually begins and ends in a gravel bed, just like this one. When they hatch, they're actually just tiny little larvae we call fish fry, and they blend in perfectly with the rocky bottom of riverbeds like this. And that's actually the primary reason that they spawn in these locations is because it's safer for the fish fry. The salmon fry will remain in this baby stage for around three years. At that point, they start to lose their camouflaged coloration. Now, they start growing silvery scales to confuse ocean predators. And their body chemistry changes to something more suitable for salt water. Then somehow, they instinctively know it is time to swim out into the open ocean. This is where they become a vital food source for marine mammals like sea lions, and southern resident killer whales, like the ones that you can see here in photos that I took several years ago. We had originally planned to film this segment out in the ocean salmon fishing on the English Bay. Unfortunately, your host got a little green around the gills. But I did manage to reel in a large Chinook salmon, which, along with the chum salmon, makes up a large majority of the southern resident killer whale diet. Yeah. That's right on. I'll do that again. <laughs> And this is just one of the reasons that salmon are considered a keystone species, because if their population decreases, it is likely to very negatively affect the orca population as well. This summer, the southern resident killer whales were absent from their primary hunting grounds for over 100 days. This was an unprecedented absence. And when they did return, several of them appeared emaciated, soon disappeared, and are unfortunately presumed dead. And that's why sustainable fishing practices are so important. Such as fishing in tightly controlled times or in specific areas, using certain fishing gear like hook and line fishing, 
and implementing best practices to release non-target species. I've provided links down below to several seafood watch lists that can help you ensure that the salmon that you're eating is sustainable. Now, let's dive deeper into something that's baffled scientists for years, the salmon's unbelievable ability to roam the open ocean for years and then wind up back at the exact same place that they were born. There are several theories about how salmon can achieve this amazing feat. Because after all, they don't have Google Maps. The prevailing theory is smell. Salmon have a very good sense of smell. In 1951, scientists hypothesized that the salmon are picking up chemical cues from the exact stream that they were born. Those same scientists then showed this to be true through a variety of experiments. Now, I don't have time to dive into all of those experiments, but if you'd like to learn more about that, you can head down to the descriptions below for links to those sources. But essentially, these scientists showed that that chemical cue, that smell from their natal stream, is imprinted on the fish fry after they hatch, and they remember it when they go out into the ocean. And so, just like the salmon, we return to the river to begin the run. Think of the salmon run as somewhat of a triathlon. It's their Olympics. It involves intense swimming, leaping, and avoiding of predators, all while uphill. Every bit of energy they have goes into this run. Essentially, their time spent in the ocean is training for this event. Because they have lots of obstacles in their way, like waterfalls, rapids, predators, even some man-made obstacles. and only a few will survive. And just like out in the ocean, they are a vital food source for animals like bears, otters, and even humans. Even just walking up and down these shorelines, you can see a multitude of wolf and bear tracks everywhere you look. Here's a big old wolf track here. Got the big spread of the toes. This is a big track. Look at that. It's almost the size of my hand. <laughs> but they're not just a food source for these animals. They're a food source for the forests and the ecosystem itself. Because bears and mustelids like river otters or mink will take their fish into the forest to consume it but they don't always consume all of it. And the carcass left behind will feed the forest floor with oceanic nutrients like nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. In fact, it's estimated that 24% of the necessary phosphorus to feed these forests is deposited by bears, who can deposit around 4,000 kilograms of salmon per hectare via doo-doo. Without the salmon run, these forest ecosystems would likely collapse. Another reason why salmon are a keystone species. Nice female. Yeah, she's beautiful. Okay. All right. See you later. Nice work. But their story isn't over. Once the salmon reach their breeding ground, the females will form nests with their tails in the gravel called reds, where they will then deposit their eggs. The males come along and fertilize the eggs just before the female buries them with a layer of gravel. The females will do this anywhere from five to eight times, laying thousands and thousands of eggs. But this journey, this adventure, has a price. There's a fish, like a dying fish right behind you. That boy is not doing well. Spawning salmon that have spent years out to sea are no longer adapted for freshwater environments. Like that guy, who's just about ready to become somebody's meal. <laughs> not only that, but it's such an arduous journey that they do not have time to feed during it. So once they spawn, they pretty quickly die. 
And while that's weird, or at least I think it's weird, it also deposits countless kilograms of salmon and nutrients into the riverbed. And then the cycle starts all over again. Here's a bonus fact to blow your mind. Pink salmon, like the ones we're catching here today, only live in the ocean for two years before they start their run. That means pink salmon running on even years and pink salmon running on odd years never interbreed. So it's very possible that at some point in the near future, those two will be considered two different species. I think that's absolutely wild. And if you do too, make sure to like, subscribe, and head down to the descriptions below for links, sources, and ways that you can help support the channel. You can also head on over to my Twitch channel where we talk live about things like marine mammals. Hope to see you again. Cheers. Just, just sign of the polish is completely... <laughs>